Welcome to the Allergy and Asthma Network's 2016 webinar series titled Advances in Allergy and Asthma. I'm Sally Schessler, the Network's Director of Education. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to this month's offering in this year's webinar series. We are inviting nationally respected speakers to join us each month to talk about issues that are important to you. Please plan to join us each month. For our August webinar, we will be presenting the September Asthma Peak, Clinical Trends, and Practical Strategies. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Brian Martin as our speaker today. Dr. Martin is the current president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. He is an emeritus professor of medicine and pediatrics at The Ohio State University, where he served as the designated institutional official, associate dean for graduate medical education, and associate medical director of university hospitals. Prior to his time at Ohio State, he spent 28 years in the United States Army, where he was chair of the Department of Allergy, Immunology, and Immunizations, and the Allergy Immunology Program Director at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C., and was the specialty consultant to the Army Surgeon General for Allergy, Immunology, and Immunizations. Dr. Martin has been a Program Director in Allergy and Immunology for over 15 years, and served as the chair of the Allergy Immunology Residency Review Committee of the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. He is the recipient of the prestigious ACGME Courage to Teach Award for Excellence Among Program Directors and the Lewis Aspie Malone Award from the Army Surgeon General for Academic Excellence in Military Medicine. An advocate for maintaining the humanism in medicine, he has been elected into the Gold Humanism Honor Society and received an Osler Award for Outstanding Work in Medicine and the Arts at Ohio State. He did his internal medicine training at the William Beaumont Army Medical Center in El Paso, Texas, and his allergy immunology training at Fitzsimmons Army Medical Center in Denver, Colorado. Dr. Martin, we're so pleased to have you with us today, and uh, we're eager to hear from you. Sally, thanks for that kind introduction, and welcome to everybody, and thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to spend some time with us. So what I would like to talk to, to about today is the September asthma peak, and really talk about why there might be a peak in asthma symptoms, particularly among children in September. And if there is a, an asthma peak in September, what we might do about it and how we might alleviate that. Asthma is definitely a problem in the United States. If we look at the 5 to 14 year old age group, over 10% of those children have asthma. So that's over 4 million children with asthma. If we look at the 15 to 19 year old age group, it's over 9% or another 2 million children with asthma. And these kids have exacerbations and miss school days. And so a total of 12.8 of million school days a year are missed because of asthma. This is really a problem. And it's the third ranking cause of hospitalization for children. If that's not bad enough, people still die from asthma. Now, over 4,000 people die every year from asthma, or 11 people every day. These aren't children. These are across all ages. But 11 people die from asthma every day. That, that's a scary statistic in a world where we have drugs that really should be able to help these folks. And this is a problem worldwide and nationwide. And this description just shows that where we have a high incidence of asthma or a higher incidence of asthma in the Northeast and a lower incidence of asthma in our Northwestern states. The good news is that the asthma-related emergency room visits in the 0 to 17-year-old age group in the U.S. have been going down from 92 to 2006. But the slope of that downward trend is certainly not as the way we would like it. And we see with when we look at hospitalizations in children from 0 to 17 again, after seeing hospitalizations go up until about 1992, we have begun to see a downward trend rather than an upward trend in hospitalizations in children under 17. And then 
if we look at deaths, and this is specifically deaths in children under 17, not all deaths due to asthma, we see that that same downward trend has begun, and it did begin in the mid-90s and is has gone downward. So these are all heartening trends. But we still have problems with asthma. And one of the questions I ask myself is, why is asthma so hard to treat? We've been looking at this for, for years. We have a number of guidelines for asthma. We have great medications to treat asthma, and our patients consider, continue to suffer. And I think that part of the reason they suffer is that asthma isn't a single disease. Asthma is more than one disease. It's a heterogeneous group of problems that have similar symptoms of difficulty breathing and wheezing. But our patients have different triggers that, that make them have difficulty. Their underlying pathophysiology or pathobiology is different. And because of that, they respond differently to our medicines. So I love this image that's shown here for a couple of reasons. One is it, it makes me feel like a child who's about to go back to school in those last wonderful days of summer. But I look, look at the ripples from this, this young man who's skipping a rock. And asthma, to me, is a lot like these pools of ripples. In one sense, each of those ripples is the same, but they're, in another sense, they're each very different, and, and they're caused by a different skip of the stone. And so asthma is sort of these, like the ripples that we see here, the different people with different kinds of asthma, different endotypes or phenotypes of asthma are, are similar, but in the end, they're different. So we have this September peak of, of asthma. In the 38th week of the year, or the third week of September, is consistently the peak time for asthma attacks among children and youth. And, and this is, we, we look at this, or we, we say this on the basis of visits to the emergency room for asthma exacerbation and for hospitalizations for asthma in school-aged children. Now, this is an interesting phenomenon. So this is a study that was done in 2007 in Ontario, and they did an interesting thing with this study. They took the data from a number of years, from 2001 to 2005, and they condensed all of that data so that it would, it would be shown as if it were just in one year. And what they showed in this blue line is that in children between 2 and 15 years old, there is this very high spike in asthma exacerbations among these children. We see a little bit of a spike in people from 16 to 49, and really not anywhere near that much of a spike in those that are over 50. Why is this spike, in, and if you look at what this chart is telling us, that children are twice as likely to have an exacerbation of asthma in that 38th week of the year than they are on the average week during that time period. So big spike in, on week 38 during September in the years from 2001 to 2005, and then in a follow-on study, they showed that this consistent September spike can be seen in every year from 2006 to 2012, even as the number of emergency room visits in Ontario overall were going down. So there is this September spike that has maintained a consistent part of our asthma milieu over more than a decade. So why September? What is so different about the 38th week of the year that we see this spike? And I think the biggest thing that we see is this is our back to school time. This is a time when we see the stress of school, of our school days, and our expectations of performance during school. It's a time where we have a relative crowding in school. We have 
an increased number of infections because our friend cohort expands dramatically when we go back to school. Kids have a, a smaller cohort of friends that they deal with day in and day out during the summer. They go back to school and their cohort of people that they meet on a day-by-day -day basis increases dramatically. At the same time, there are things that are going on with our climate. The weather is getting colder, and this is a time when both ragweed, other weeds, and mold pollens, pollens are on the increase. So on the outside, we have triggers that are becoming worse. And then on the inside, we have not only this close association with the other kids in schools, but because it's getting colder, we close the doors and, and windows. Many of our schools are relatively tight buildings, and I'll hit on that in, in, a, in a minute. And then there may be some lingering effects from our summer vacation and our summertime activities that, that affect what happens when we go back to school. So the, the question one might ask is, so school causes asthma. And I know some kids that would love to tell their parents that school causes asthma so they shouldn't go to school. Because returning to school is stressful in an emotional time period. It's a social time period and this close contact that, that I talked about can spread disease. The other thing is that schools are institutions. And we hate to think about this, but our schools have potential for exposure to allergens, not only such as pollen that, that come in through the windows and doors and mold, but mice and cockroaches and potentially other animals that might be in the classroom. Our schools have high traffic situations. We have these two periods of time in the day at least when buses and cars line up on the outside of the school to drop off kids and, and then they come back and they line up to pick up kids. So we have our potential exposure to an increase in air pollution then. And many of our schools are, are built near highways or near busy roads where we have higher degrees of air pollution. And then schools have exercise programs that may impact our asthmatic children. So I started with stress. We know that returning to school can be stressful for kids and that stress is a well-known cause of asthma exacerbations. We all associate school with academics. With our academics, we have the pressure of tests, the pressure of papers, the pressure of performance, the pressure of trying to do well. There are also social pressures at work. So I talked about the, the, the fact that we have a bigger cohort of children that we meet and we work with and we interact with on a day-by-day -day basis. But there are also other social problems that intervene. And our asthmatic children don't want to be different. They don't want to be seen as different than other kids. And so there are issues around the use of medications and issues around having asthma that make school more stressful for some of our children who have asthma. In addition, we have our sports program, both organized sports, in, particularly in, in junior high schools and high schools, but we have the, the gymnasium or the, the gym programs and the informal sports of recess and gym class. And so this, this whole thing with bullying has really been focused on recently, and, and I certainly have looked at bullying in school much more closely than I ever used to. And I think that I underappreciated what an impact bullying made in our schools. And so if we have these social pressures, we sometimes that leads to an increased reluctance to take medications. And we also have new schedules when we go to school. And those schedules can cause problems with taking our medicines as we're trying to hurry out the door to get to the bus on time. So I, with our social interactions in school, I say that school is social. We go to school, we meet new friends, and we have them cough on us. We reconnect with old friends, and we have them cough on us. We handle items that other students have used and coughed on. So we become exposed to, to new pathogens. I'm always intrigued when new 
uh, teachers go to school. New teachers often spend the first couple of years of teaching complaining that they have some sort of virus the entire time they're teaching as they become uh, the, uh, exposed to all these new viruses within the school system. So this social aspect of school, although it's wonderful and, and we love this, the, the socialization that occurs with our children in schools, it also means that we're exposed to a number of new pathogens and potentially another, a number of uh, upper respiratory infections. And again, I keep going back to this, kids can be mean. It, there, there's bullying in school, but bullying comes in many forms, and it doesn't have to be bad bullying. It doesn't have to be something that, that would end up having a, a kid go down to the principal's office. Don't underestimate the negative effects of, of teasing among children. And kids do not want to be teased. They don't want to be marked as different. And so what is defended is, oh, I'm just kidding, I'm just teasing, can definitely change the way our children act and can affect whether or not they use their medications appropriately. And again, we don't want to think about cockroaches in our schools. We don't want to think about mice in our schools. But cockroaches and mice are attracted to places where they can find yummy food that's easy to find and it's in a safe environment. Well, we all know our kids are messy. We don't want them to be messy, but they drop things, they drop food, they drop crumbs, they, they tend to eat while walking and moving around, and if they get something on their hands, they, they, they sometimes will wipe their hands on a table or, or wipe their hands on a wall or somewhere unexpected. So in our cafeterias, we have relatively easy food sources for insects to find. And in classrooms where food is consumed or food is stored, we can have sources of food for cockroaches or, or mice. And so I like this bottom picture with all these buses because there was a, a news report of cockroaches not infecting schools, not infecting cafeterias where we would expect them to be, but infesting our school buses. And you say, wow, why would, why would we have cockroaches on the school bus? Well, kids take snacks onto the buses. And if there are crumbs on the bus, good place for, for insects to, to eat. If they get into the bus and they find food and they find a safe place to be, they'll take up residence. And so this is something that all schools have to take into consideration. And we also have classroom pets in, in, many, in many schools. So we could have mice or gerbils or hamsters or rabbits. All of those are rodents and that we can react to allergens in each of those animals. So classroom pets can be a source of allergen and classroom laboratories where there might be mice or rats can sometimes be a source of allergens. Lest we say that can't possibly happen in my school, there have been a couple of, of articles that have looked at uh, problems with lunchrooms. And in Philadelphia, over half of the public schools were out of compliance, two-thirds of the charter schools were out of the compliance, and a third of the archdiocese schools were out of compliance. And lest we say, oh, somehow the archdiocese are, are, are being able to maintain their, their cafeterias in, in better shape, look at the note, and that was 28 of the archdiocese schools either had kids bring in their own food or only served milk and snacks and didn't have food preparation in their cafeterias. It's not just an American problem. In, in a, a review of school kitchen inspections in England, they found mice, which are a potential allergy problem, ants, and moldy walls. So kitchens and cafeterias contain sources of food and water that are attractive to cockroaches and to mice, and those water sources are always a place where we can find mold. So when you think about mold, although we can, and I'll talk about it, see 
mold in dry, hot places, we typically see mold in places where we have water. So if we look at allergens that can affect the back to school time, we have allergens in the classroom and allergens outside of the classroom. Outside we have ragweed and weed pollens and outdoor molds and inside we have different molds, indoor molds, cockroaches, cats, and I, I really want to talk about cats in the classroom because I don't think any of us think that cats actually live in the classroom and other animals that, that might be in the classroom. But ragweed is a fall allergen that really needs to have our respect. This is a ragweed plant. Notice how green and lush it looks when in the background the other plants are dying out and are brown. So this ragweed pollinates in the fall. What happens is it has male flowers and female flowers. The pollen comes from male flowers. They hang upside down and when the breeze begins to blow the pollen is exposed to the breeze and then the wind can carry it away. And the wind can carry this pollen long, long distances. It's over 400 miles. And a study that I wish I had done, and I just absolutely dearly love my naval colleagues for doing this, they put a pollen collector on the back of an ocean-going naval ship and showed that they collected pollen 360 miles from any land. So this pollen can go impressive distances. And the ragweed plant is an incredible producer of pollen. A single ragweed plant can produce a billion pollen grains. So ragweed plants are incredible producers of pollens. And the count is highest right before dawn, particularly if there's a breeze. So anytime a breeze comes by, our ragweed plants in the fall are going to allow the, the ragweed pollen to go everywhere. And the, the ragweed season is usually August through October in most of the country. So in green, the, the parts of the country in green, the pollen season is August to October. In Ohio, when I was at Ohio State, I would say you can practically set your watch by, by I mean, excuse me, you can practically set your calendar by ragweed. It always starts on August 15th and it always goes until we have a hard frost. And so that's why if you, if you see that in the southern part of the country, ragweed season is a little bit longer because our hard frost is a little bit further away. So in the heartland of the United States is where we see the heaviest concentration of ragweed. But nearly the entire country is affected by ragweed. And ragweed peaks in September. If you look at these peak seasons and the peaks of different years and you see that we have peaks from 1998 to 2013, it peaks around the second or third week in September or 7 and 38. And a couple of things are, are happening that seem to be increasing the amount of ragweed that we have in the United States. One of those is the amount of CO2 in the air. And as the amount of CO2 in the air has gone up, we also see an increase in the grams of ragweed that we see as, as the, the CO2 increases. So when we look at climate change, there is a, this pollen overload in seasonal allergies in a changing climate from environmental health perspectives just this year. It just came out in April. This is a, a ragweed plant and ragweed pollen leaving it. But what they suggest is that the ragweed season or the season, the pollen season, as we get global warming, the pollen season is getting longer and longer. And it seems to across the United States, pollen season seems to be about 10 days longer. The further north you go, because of the effects of the warming, the further north you go, the, the longer the season is. And in parts of Canada, 
the pollen season is 20 days or more longer than it used to be. And ragweed's not the only pollen that we see in September. So here's our peak of weeds in Austin, Texas, but we also see molds. And in, in Texas, we have some trees that are fall pollinators too. So in different parts of the country, we have not just ragweed, but other weeds and molds that are also affecting our children. And these molds that we see can be indoors and outdoors. They're ubiquitous outdoors. They're airborne everywhere except for the polar caps. And in indoors, we have both our outdoor molds that come in and we have indoor molds from molds that grow inside. That where we generally see our molds, although they can grow in many different areas, not dry areas, we generally see mold indoors where we have poor maintenance. We have water that is allowed to be present for a period of time and that encourages mold and fungal growth. The other place we see it indoors is in our indoor plants and that's our fault. We have a, a bucket of dirt that we call a pot with a plant growing inside of it and we put water regularly into the pot and so that's a great place for mold or for fungus to grow. Mold is in the news and if, if schools have mold problems it can be remediated and we can resolve those problems. So I showed that pollens from plants were high in, the, in September. We also see that mold counts are high in September. And generally mold is a, the, the worst mold is during baseball season. It is a spring, summer, fall problem. And this is a logarithmic scale, so 100 to 1,000 is here. So this increase that we see from March through November with these, with these peaks in August and September, remember this is a logarithmic scale, so that is a, it's quite an increase during the, what I would call the baseball season months. When we look at our indoor environment, one of the problems that people talk about, and specifically folks who talk about sick building syndrome, is the fact that our modern buildings are often tight buildings. There is an organization called the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, or ASHRAE. And these are the people who publish the standards for ventilation. And mandatory ventilation for buildings in the United States has decreased. This is their homepage, and if you ever want to spend some time that before you go to bed falling asleep, this is it's a dense, scientific, difficult to read uh, website. But this is their their homepage. What they at Ashra said was in 1930 they thought that the building should have 10 to 20 cubic foot per minute per occupant of ventilation. By 1973, that had edged down or eased down, and it was 20 cubic feet per occupant. But in 1973, the gas crisis hit, and our response was to tighten our buildings to make them more fuel efficient. And that went down to 5 cubic feet per occupant, and that was probably too little. And by 1997, it went back up to 15 cubic feet per occupant. And what I love is that that's exactly the midpoint in the 1930, 10 to 20 cubic feet per minute per occupant, which is where our buildings are now. And so mold has made the news. Killed is in the news. There, it is easy to find scary, scary misinformation out on the Internet about mold. Is there potential for mold in our houses and our schools? Absolutely. Is mold going to kill us because it's it's in the it, we have toxins in the mold that it, are going to are going to cause us to have a, a horrendous end? No. That there's a lot of of scary misinformation. But we can find mold in our schools, and when we do, we should remediate it. Again, we typically see mold where there's a water source. So if you were to see something like this, which is the, the head for the, 
the sprinkler system and see mold like this, you have to think that there's probably a leak up under the, in, in the ceiling that's causing that mold. And so when we have mold problems in our schools, we should communicate with the schools, identify it, and ask them to remediate that. I said I'd talk about cats in the classroom or cat allergens in the classroom, and, and this is always fascinating to me. Cat antigen is becoming more and more appreciated, and cat antigen is a small particle with an electrical charge. It sticks to clothing, and kids can carry it from home to the classroom. And what this electrical charge does it's much like what rubbing a balloon on your hair does. So if you, if you take a balloon that's inflated and you rub it on your hair, you'll impart an electrical charge, a static electricity charge on it, and that's what allows it to stick on the wall or stick on the ceiling. Cat antigen has an electrical charge just like that, and that makes cat antigen stick to, stick to clothing. So if we have a classroom, where many of the class, more than 25% of the class, have cats at home, those classrooms have cat allergen that's higher than other classrooms. Notice it doesn't say have cat antigen when other classrooms don't. Cat antigen has become a ubiquitous antigen in the United States. We see it in movie theaters, it's everywhere, but it's higher in classrooms where we have a number of cat owners among our students in the classroom. So what happens then is if I don't have a cat at home but I go to my classroom where I have a bunch of kids who do have cats at home, when I leave the classroom the allergen levels of cat allergen on my clothing will be higher than when I came in and I will have had a potential exposure to cat antigen during the day. So this exposure through school can exacerbate asthma in a cat allergic child who doesn't own a cat. So if we have a cat allergic asthmatic who is really struggling at school and we can't figure out why, it just there's nothing that we can identify that is problematic for that child in the classroom and we see that, that he goes to school, he or she goes to school and and it's worse when they come home, this is one thing that we might want to think about. Is there a possibility that there is enough cat antigen in that classroom that it's causing a problem? And certainly an irritant or air pollution can be a problem in or near schools. So we, the, you know, the buses and the cars come up and they line up out front and the kids walk past all of those buses that are, are often sitting there with their engines running and those pollutants from the the engines if the doors or windows are open can go inside and certainly in schools that are built near highways or busy roads <clears throat> can have a high degree of air pollution and that air pollution comes in a number of different ways diesel motors create particulate pollution and in really bad diesel motors you can actually see that that brown, or excuse me, that black sooty exhaust come out that has particulate matter in it. But gasoline engines and car engines and gasoline engines in buses also contribute to hydrocarbon pollution, nitrogen oxide pollution, carbon monoxide pollution, sulfur dioxide, and toxic chemicals that can be in the exhaust. So we're the classrooms tend to be in areas where vehicles congregate at least twice a day. Exercise is also a contributor to, to problems that we have in school. Obviously exercise is an important part of life, it's an important part of our school day, but this outdoor exercise in an environment that's beginning to get cold is particularly difficult for children who either have exercise-induced asthma or cold-induced asthma or allergic asthma when they're in season. So here we have kids who would typically, before they exercise, we would ask them to use a prophylactic beta agonist. And if they are to use a prophylactic beta agonist, the physician and parents need to not only say, I want you to use this, this beta agonist before you exercise, 
but also be willing to ask the questions. Are you comfortable doing that? And not just ask it before school begins, but ask it after they've been to school for a while. Ask if they have difficulty with anybody in the classroom or they get teased about their, their beta agonist or their use of this medicine or teased about being an asthmatic. The NHLBI has guidelines for a healthy school environment. They, they have guidelines regarding temperature and humidity, the maintaining the, the heating and air conditioning systems, and again, this is largely in part so we don't have mold inside the HVAC systems. We don't have, if, if you have a, a system that is not maintained properly, you can have increased mold difficulty. Certainly want to dry up any damp or wet areas as quickly as possible within one to two days so that we don't have mold issues with that and to minimize exposure to triggers, uh, smoke, chemical vapor, vapors. I don't think that chalk dust is, uh, is as big a problem in these days as it was when I was in school, but still might be something of a problem. But I think that mold and fumes and animals are still a problem. So when we go back to school, I think that we have to appreciate difficulties with the use of medication. So when we go back to school and we have all of these, these new schedules, <clears throat> particularly in the early part of the year when we're getting used to the schedule, and I, I as a student can't sleep in anymore, I have to get up a little bit earlier, I'm, I'm hurried in the morning, everybody's a little bit harried on a morning routine, parents who are used to going to, to work now have to get themselves to work and the kids to school. So it's easy to forget medications when we have changing schedules or different routines. And at school, oh, you know, I'm so used to, to my kids forgetting their homework, their backpack, anything that they're not wearing, that the, this forgetting to take medications to school is not uncommon. And if they do remember to take their medicines to school, I remain concerned about whether or not our students are reticent to use their medications because of social pressures within the classroom. And summer was also a time of changing schedules, and this may affect the September peak in asthma. And you may say, well, what do you mean? How can the summer experience affect the third week in September? Well, asthma doesn't just occur overnight. If we're taking an anti-inflammatory medication, like an inhaled corticosteroid, and we become less diligent about using it or we stop using it, as particularly teenagers are wont to do, we, if in, in that disruptive schedule in the summer, if in particularly in vacation schedules and late summer vacations, if our students stop taking their inhaled corticosteroids, they allow inflammation to begin. And so that inflammation may be asymptomatic for weeks or more. But then when they get to school and they get around these triggers that I've walked through, that underlying inflammation makes that exacerbation happen more quickly and may make that exacerbation worse. So there are a number of forces which may promote the September peak in asthma, the stress and emotion of, of going to school, the influence of friends while we're at school, the activities that we undergo while we're in school, the potential for infections from all of those friends that we met, our schedules are changing, then we're, we're exposed to a number of things to include pollution from the buses and from our autos, indoor and outdoor allergens, and so there's a number of stressors that occur in September that can lead to an exacerbation. So we have to say, what can we do to protect our children from school exacerbations? And we have to remember that good health care is an absolute team sport. Certainly part of that team is the patient himself or herself, the parents, the family, the physicians and the healthcare team, but the school team have to be brought in also. The teachers, the school nurse, the administrative and the office staff all have to be part of our 
good healthcare team and taking care of our school-aged asthmatic. So before school starts, parents need to make sure that the and patients need to make sure that the patient is taking his or her medications appropriately and diligently during the summer. And we all have to pay particular attention to the appropriate use of controller medication during those busy summer months. This is a time really to talk to the children, and this I'm, I'm talking to parents and doctors both here, that we need to talk to the kids, we need to make sure that the, that the child knows that if there's a problem at school, they need to come home and talk to the parents or they need to say something to the physician or the healthcare team so that if there's a problem with medications at school that can be alleviated. That they have to go to school with, a, with an, action, an asthma action plan. So late summer is a great time to go see the, your asthma healthcare provider for a preschool visit to make sure the student has an up-to-date age-appropriate asthma action plan. And that asthma action plan may change with changing asthma, with changing age of the student. Once we have that asthma action plan, parents and students should understand the rules and expectations at the school regarding students who have chronic medical conditions and need medications. The, the parents should understand whether or not there's a nurse at the school. Is a nurse there all the time or only on certain days or certain times? When and where is a nurse present? Where can the student go for help if the nurse is present or not present? Is the student allowed, allowed to carry his or her medication? Is the student old enough to carry their own medications and understand when to use the medications? So that's part of that. We all have to work together to make sure that the patient uses the, the medications right. And then hand hygiene. My, my question to myself is, what does hand washing have to do with asthma? And the answer is everything. We have to stop the transmission of viral illnesses and other illnesses within the school environment by ensuring that, that our students wash their hands often. We should really consider having a, a, a hand gel, an alcohol-based hand gel for uh, cleaning the hands when it's not convenient to go to the restroom and we should make sure that we keep sick children home from school but there are a number of pressures that push children to go to school even when they're sick. So the September peak is real. There is a September peak in asthma exacerbation. It, it seems to be more pronounced in children and coincide with their back to school activities. Patients, parents, physicians, nurses, we all need to be aware of the issue and prepare for it. And those preparations begin in the summer. Paying careful attention to control or use no matter how hectic the summer gets. Make sure that we're controlling inflammation during the summer to protect lungs from the asthma peak. In those first few days or few, first few weeks of school, the, the, the student should make sure they're having good hand hygiene and understand why. The school should have a copy of the asthma action plan. The specific steps for managing this particular student's asthma at school should be clear. And I think the parents should ask for a conference with teachers to specifically explain the asthma action plan, what the triggers are, what the severity of the asthma is, what our worries are, and what the common symptoms for this particular child are. If medications are left at school, we need to take control of tracking the dates on the medicines, making sure that they stay in date, making sure that, that we know how much of the medicine is used. And when at school, I think our, our parents have to be detectives. It's not just for the parent-teacher conference, but being at school gives parents a chance to look around the school, to look for known allergy or asthma triggers. And then if we identify them, I don't think we should we should identify them and approach them in a confrontational model, but we should approach the teachers and help them reduce exposure to known triggers. I, I preach to my fellows that assume positive intentions. Everybody wants best. Everybody wants what's best for the students. So if we can help the teachers provide an environment that is best for the students, we all win.
when our, our students are going to school, we need to watch for signs and symptoms of decreased asthma control. And when a student comes home, ask questions. Make sure that you, want, that you know that they're comfortable taking medicines at school. That asthma action plan really is critical. So make sure that, that your asthma physician provides an asthma action plan before school starts and make sure that all the teachers and everybody who's involved with the student during the day knows about that asthma action plan. And for some reason, people tend to forget about the, the, the poor gym teacher. And the gym teacher certainly needs to know what to do in case there's an asthma exacerbation, just like the rest of the teachers do. So bottom line is, when it comes to our September asthma peak and what we can do about it, we need to be a detective. We need to look for allergens, look for triggers, and help the student devise avoidance strategy, ask questions, and make sure that we know as much as we possibly can know about what goes on in the school environment and whether or not our student can take their medications appropriately. School's stressful. There are a variety of reasons for this. Academic, the athletic programs, the social aspects and the social stresses, and the fact that, again, bullying exists and it comes in many forms and some don't seem to be bad, like teasing, but can affect our students' use of medication. So we need to monitor the students' activities, students' mood, symptoms, and medication use. And I know this is a time period when moods change relatively dramatically, but, but we need to try to stay on top of that. I certainly appreciate your attention on a beautiful, at least where I am in Florida, on a beautiful afternoon. And we'll be happy to entertain any questions. Well, first of all, Dr. Martin, thank you so much for all this information. I appreciated learning more about ragwood season, and you taught me things about cat allergen that I didn't know before. And I agree with you that every parent and every child needs to be a detective to figure out what can be going on sometimes. So thank you again. We do have some questions. Uh, here's one. Uh, is it possible that week 38 and week 52 have common causes? Stress of returning to school, stress of Christmas and New Year's holidays? I think they have even more uh, the association than that because on week 52, think about what we do. Notice that the week 52 peak is lower than the, than the week 38 peak. Week 52, we're generally gathering in family groups. It's another time when we remix our cohorts and we we remix who we're around. But it's also a time when we go to the attic or down in the basement and pull those decorations out that have been sitting there for 50 weeks and getting dust and mold on them. And so we, we get these uh, decorations out that have, that have been around for a while and so we create a, a, sometimes a dust storm in the house. Some people bring in live Christmas trees into the house and that may create some problems. So yes, there are a number of interesting parallels between week 38 and week 52. I absolutely agree. Okay. Uh, a recent study published in Respiratory Care demonstrated that 25% of college students were likely to have exer exercise-induced asthma. Could this be true in elementary and high schools too? So part of that is, do we fully respect, I, I, I'm, I'm rephrasing the question, do we fully respect exercise-induced asthma? And is there exercise-induced asthma out there that we are not, uh, we're not treating, we're not appreciating, we're not diagnosing? And that probably is the case. Many times kids say, I'm just not good in sports, or I'm just not as fast as my friends, and we just say, well, that's, that's the way it is. We don't investigate to see if there's an underlying asthmatic portion to that decrease in performance. Or we just think that it's, it's the fact that, that somebody is deconditioned or not in shape yet. And so what we do is we exhort them to work harder rather than necessarily investigating the, the underlying cause. And, and so there, there may very, very well be more exercise-induced bronchospasm than we appreciate. 
Okay. Uh, can deep breathing exercises in gym classes help offset the asthma triggers students face in schools? That, that's a great question. I don't know who sent that in, but that is a great question and a great controversy right now. And there are some people who really think that deep breathing exercises, and particularly uh, yoga-based or, or um, uh, meditation-based deep breathing, can help asthma. And there have been some studies that have looked at that. And the, the studies to this point are not conclusive. Nobody can say that the studies show, yes, it does. Nobody can say that the studies show, no, it doesn't help. It certainly doesn't cause a problem. And I would not tell people to not do that. I don't have good evidence yet that it is necessarily helpful. Okay. But that is being Okay. Well, along with allergens in the classroom, there are an abundance of irritants, scented products like air fresheners and scented oils. Could you address these as well, please? There, that, absolutely. And the, the fact is that we know that we have a number of asthmatics who have difficulty when they are exposed to irritants. We'll never be able to get all the irritants out of the classroom. But here's where I think that whole detective hat is so important. If you have a child who is struggling with the classroom and you sort of go through your checklist and you can't find any reason that they're struggling, then that's when you may begin to say, if you, if you have a child that you know has irritant triggers, you may begin investigating sources of irritant triggers that would affect that particular child in the classroom. And you may be able to detect one that, that could be easily removed. Avoidance is incredibly important, both in allergy-based asthma or, or allergies, period, and in irritation-based phenomenon like non-allergic rhinitis that is based on irritants or non-allergic asthma that is triggered by irritants. Okay. Well, what can we do about the cat allergen? You, you identified the problem. Is there anything we can do? There's, unfortunately, first of all, it's, it's nice that we appreciate it. So we didn't appreciate it at first. We didn't That's understand right. that, that cat antigen was different. It's hard enough in a family when one child is cat allergic and a second child has a cat to try to intervene. That is nearly impossible. So the, on, on the hierarchy of difficulty, it's a child who has a cat that he or she dearly loves, and that child is allergic to the cat. They certainly don't want to get rid of the cat. A child who owns a cat, loves a cat, and has a brother or sister who's allergic to the cat would rather give away the brother or sister than <laughs> give away the cat most of the time. And now we're in a situation where it's an indirect link to the cat, and, and we, we're, we're not going to be able to say, if you're going to be in my classroom, you have to get rid of your cat at home. That, that certainly isn't going to work. So this is something that we need to appreciate, but it's not something that is easily changed. Okay. What is your take on prescribing inhaled corticosteroids intermittently through the year? Example, uh, prescribing them for allergy season or for viral season or in anticipation of the asthma peak. There, there's, there's data, but not for all of the permutations of that question. Okay. So there, is, there is data in allergic asthma, seasonal allergic asthma, that seasonalization of inhaled corticosteroids can be effective. I am concerned about saying I'm going to give it during seasonal, uh, excuse me, do it during uh, period, peak periods of infection because that's a little bit harder to predict. Can be. But there is, there is data that intermittent use is better than no use. That there are people who are very concerned about inhaled corticosteroids in any form. And those folks, uh, I, I, would, I would struggle. 
outside of the seasonal allergens to say to agree with using inhaled corticosteroids intermittently. Okay. But that's something that I would I would talk to my physician one on one about that because we certainly also at the same time want to minimize the use of steroids in everybody. So we want to use as much as we need, as often as we need, and not overuse them. Okay. Well, Dr. Martin, how much do you think cleaning products in the schools come into play as an asthma trigger? I think that depends. That's a patient-by-patient -patient issue more than a school-by-school -school issue. We know we have this subpopulation of patients who have difficulty around irritants. And you could have a, a number of asthmatics who walk right past these irritants and have no problem whatsoever. And then we have a, a, a child who really is sensitive to irritants that will, that will really have trouble. So this, this goes back to how I opened, and that is one of the things that makes asthma hard is that everybody's asthma is somewhat different. It's a heterogeneous group of diseases rather than a single disease. I've told parents so often, if you've seen one case of asthma, you've seen one case of asthma. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and here's, the, here's uh, this will probably be, uh, we'll have two more questions. So this will be our second to last question. How is it, how best would you approach the issue of parents or healthcare providers who do not provide the school nurse with an asthma action plan? I think one would be to, to simply ask them if, if they have one, if, if you know, has, I, I would say something like um, most of the time when we have a, an asthmatic in the school, we have an asthma action plan that will help us provide appropriate care to your, your child or to the student. Do you have one? It may be, I mean, you know, people have so many different reasons for not, <clears throat> for not doing what I expect. And, and, and I, have, I have found this so often, and it may be just that there are some people that, that feel like they're being overbearing by coming in and saying, well, here's, here's my asthma action plan. Here's how I want you to take care of my kid. So we should ask. Or they may not have asked their, their provider for an asthma action plan. And so that would drive them to go back and say, can I have an asthma action plan for my child for the school? I'm, I am all for upfront open, honest communication. I really do think, you know, that in, at the end of the day, we're all trying to do the right thing. And to assume positive intentions is a, is a driving force. So as a school nurse, you assume positive intentions and you just say, do we have one? Most of our asthmatics do. And you may be surprised at the answer. Okay, well, that question took a little longer than I thought, but I love your answer. And I love the thought of just expecting good intentions from people. So again, thank you so much. Um, we're going to ask you to all join us for our remaining webinars in our series. The next one is September 14th at 4 p.m. when Dr. Tanya Elliott, the Medical Director of Doctors on Demand, will speak to us about telehealth in a program titled Website, versus bedside manner telehealth for allergies and asthma please watch for registration information on our website which is allergy asthma network.org click on education and then webinars to register and also find our recorded webinars there our webinar series helps the allergy and asthma network to live out our mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma allergies and related conditions through outreach advoca education advocacy and research and dr Martin, if you could just move the slide forward one, please. Before we part days ways today, I'd like to encourage everyone to uh, sign up for one of our U.S. anaphylaxis summits. They are open for registration in three great cities throughout the country. 
We're going to be presenting these in September and October in Las Vegas, Nevada, St. Louis, Missouri, and Orlando, Florida. Our sites this year are great for not only some great learning, but also some personal and family vacation time as well. We're going to be addressing important issues that affect us and so many of us that we care for. We've worked to spread these conferences out across the country, so one should be within reach of you. There's no registration fee for the conference, and we have people come from all walks of life. Physicians, allergists, health professionals, nurses, parents, and patients come together to listen to the latest health information from leading national experts and then have a multidisciplinary conversation about challenges and solutions related to anaphylaxis management. Please register for the conferences now as registration will close soon. Thank you again for joining us today. This is Sally Schessler, Director of Education, uh, speaking for the Allergy and Asthma Network. Thank you so much.